Bob, hey everybody, Last Outrider here, and I'm back with another video, and this time I'm talking about who is the emperor from then and now. The emperor, like just about everything in 40K, has changed over time. I'm going to try to make this a short video because I'm going to cover 30 plus years of 40K <laughs> in hopefully less than 15 minutes, just out of my head. Okay, there's no books. I don't read anything here. I just, I just pull this out as I'm talking. Yeah, it's amazing, but true. So, the emperor in 40... Okay, I got to give context here. The state of RPGs back when Warhammer came out, when Rogue Trader came out, is that games did not have a fixed world like they have now. Think about Dungeons and Dragons, which was the inspiration for 40K, uh, um, obviously. Dungeons and Dragons didn't have a fixed world. The world of Greyhawk was the first world for complete world that you could buy as a module, but that didn't mean that was the universe of Dungeons and Dragons. It was the same for 40K. They released a book. This book gave you source material for you to create your own 40K world in which people did. And in this world, there was an emperor who controlled things, and you're the one who's supposed to fill in all the details of it. Uh, maybe there would have been a, so a source book in the future if Rogue Trader came and kept on going, uh, but it became Warhammer 40K instead. Now, it was obviously based upon Paul, M Paul Mordib, Paul Atreides from Dune, that's why they have the color gold everywhere. That was Paul's color, too, with the golden path. And he kept on seeing gold. And the emperor got very attached to gold, too. Now, you might think that might be because he's the emperor. Wrong. Historically speaking, purple is the color of emperors. Because purple is worth far more than gold. That's for those petty little kings and stuff. In fact, I think there's only two national flags that have the color purple in it as little tiny spots. Go look that up and find out why that is, why purple is worth far more than gold. So, gold came from the Golden Path and because in Rick Priestley's Rogue Trader, while he was still creating the 40K uh, storyline. Fundamentally different. There's some connections that they couldn't get rid of. The, it doesn't make sense because a lot of the enemies of the Imperium from Rogue Trader and 3rd Edition don't exist anymore. We still have this draconian, tyrannical regime but without really a reason for why it's occurring. So I'm, I have to give you a brief, very brief. If you want to know more, go watch my Rogue Trader videos about what the Rogue Trader universe was like. In fact, it's so different from 40K today. It could be its own game. You could, you could probably re-release Rogue Trader if you wanted, and it would be so different from 40K, they, they wouldn't even be able to, to say you're, you're doing a copyright infringement. So, in the rogue trader world, the enemy of mankind was threefold. It was the Psych Nguyen, these psychic uh, wasps who are able to take over humans' psyches, pass their psyche into humans, and take them over. Um, think. Denzel Washington in Fallen with Azazel. Uh, the consciousness is able to pass from human to human to human by touch instantaneously. Okay? Um, and there would be a hive somewhere with the Cygnuian reproducing and taking over more people and the whole worlds could fall. It, this was the precursor to gene stealer cults before gene stealers became tyrannid. This was an attempt to keep that original storyline going with instead of it being 
psychic bugs, it was going to be gene stealers. Um, the second problem is psychers. <clears throat> psychers were living bombs. Possession at this time didn't just mean you became a demon host and went berserk. Uh, it meant that you exploded. If you became a gateway for the warp or the warp came through you as a psyker, you exploded with the force of a, up to a small nuclear uh, device capable of destroying, you know, half a hive city or a whole hive city. And this made psychers extremely dangerous, needed to be hunted down at all costs. Why? Because some psyker hiding in somebody's house somewhere is literally the analogous to somebody carrying a suitcase nuke and hiding it in their house and that could go off at any time. You could understand the manhunt or, or the type of investigative procedures that would uh, trigger. And now imagine that there could be an unknown number of these on any planet around the Imperium. How would you deal with that? Next, and this is one that has completely disappeared, vampires. Yes, I'm talking true blood. I'm talking vampire the masquerade. I'm talking cabals and families. Straight up vampires taking over planets was a problem in Rogue Trader. Vampires existed and they are all the vampire stories that you would think of today existed in 40K. Uh, so these were the three main problems. And this is why, this is why, because of the vampires, is where you had this pseudo-religious thing with the Inquisition and the Sisters of Battle and the Brotherhoods and everything like that coming about. Uh, because there was this vampire hunter culture in Rogue Trader. That's how that got there. Makes sense now, doesn't it? Now, <clears throat> think uh, Mila Jojovich in Ultraviolet, and you get a pretty close description of what vampires were like in 40K, except for more powerful and more organized. In fact, to the point that um, The vampiric process was reproducible by technology, and it was suggested that one of the reasons the emperor was able to live 10,000 years was from using some type of technological vampiric process. Some of the space marine chapters also uh, practiced this along with cannibalism um, in order to stay alive longer. The, originally, the idea of feeding psychers to keep the Astronomicon going, that's years into the future. Now the idea is uh, these higher ups, the Space Marine chapters, the Emperor, they're feeding on other people to stay alive uh, as human vampires that aren't vampires because that's what they did. This, you can see that in at least two of the original Space Marine chapters, one being uh, the Blood Angels, obviously, another one being the Flesh Terrors, and uh, I think there's Blood Drinkers. Now, remember, these are not successor chapters in Rogue Trader. They are just, Rogue Trader just gives you 20 template example chapters of to help you create your own concept of Space Marine chapters. They are not original, they are not the original 20, they are no more special than anything you would create yourself. They are just examples. They're, the differences in them is not because they're really that much cultural difference or they had other primaries, but because they just wanted to give you a vast spectrum of array of how Space Marines uh, chapters could exist and then uh, let you go wild. And some of those examples were vampiric and cannibalistic space marine chapters to allow them to be stronger and, and live longer. Because there is no gene seed, there is no primarchs, 
at in, in the 40K era. So where they got their superhuman speed and strength and whatnot, that's up to you as the game master to decide. And you could very well decide that the reason why they're bigger, stronger, tougher, more resilient is because they're, you know, mutant people. Okay, so that's Emperor 1.0. Um, and that's why the Imperium is so draconian with all these pogroms and all these searches and all these genetic searches um, because they don't know who's human. It could be a vampire. who Somebody could have been taken over by a vampire and got into a position of power and then had his thralls around him, and they need to find that person. It could be a Psychnuian who took over a person just yesterday, and now that person is in charge of a, in a position of power. It could be a mutant. It could be a latent psyker who might blow up at any time. Now, in that world where you had all of these threats where being human is something you could never be sure of who you're talking to, that's where the draconian uh, pseudo-religious feel came from. That's why space marines lived in a cloistered brotherhoods and sisters lived in cloistered nunneries uh, to keep them apart, to make sure that they knew that these were real humans, that they hadn't been compromised in some way. That's where that came from. That has pretty much disappeared as the threats in modern 40K, but you can't really retcon that that much. They're probably going to retcon it now with the new Imperium, but that's where that came from. Then came the Primarchs. Now, the original Primarchs um, were not the precursors of sp space marines. In fact, what they were was they were a project gone wrong, the emperor created these 20 beings in a non-reproducible uh, process, which was stolen away by chaos. Um, and in, since they couldn't reproduce the process, what he did is they salvaged what was left of the Primarch project, which was the creation of these uh, 20 different organs and implants. And couldn't create more Primarchs, so instead kind of dumbed down these organs and made them implantable into humans so that they then became space marines. It was basically space marines were salvaged from the Primarch project. Uh, now, that, that would be Emperor 2.0. Um, now, the Space Marines came before the Primarchs and, uh, and the Thunder Warriors before them. That would all be Emperor 3.0. That's when we're starting to get into the, into the Horus Heresy. So at, this point, at that point in time, the Primarchs weren't really defined. Uh, we just knew they existed, but not that much about them. In, in Emperor 3.0 or the Horus Heresy times, this is when we really started to find out about succession chapters and the Horus Heresy and everything like that. Now, at that time, uh, the original heresy came about in Horus 1.0 because the emperor made him more master and then went back to, went back to Terra and Horus had an existential crisis and he was so terrified of failure so terrified of letting the emperor down that basically he, he said, screw it, you know, if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail on my terms. I'm going to turn traitor. That's what I'm going to do. Now you're not going to call me a failure. You didn't fire me. I quit type of, <laughs> that, was this, that was the rationale, the original rationale for the Horus Heresy. Um, that later then was decided to be too juvenile and stupid. So they came with Horus was wounded and died and resurrected and possessed by a demon. And that was the real Horus, and that's why he turned traitor. Okay, that turned out to be too simplistic. So uh, we, we get Horus um, 2.0. Well, that's Horus 2.0. Horus 3.0 is he died, he was resurrected, but he was not taken over by a demon. He never worshipped chaos. 
he just had this corrupting warp power or influence over him, and that's what made him a sadistic madman instead of the charismatic leader that he was before. That was 3.0. And this is all during the Horace Heresy novels. You can see this, these changes happening there. And then we get Horace uh, 4.0, where he walks uh, the obsidian path and gains, gains all the, the insight that the emperor has and the, the shattered psyche. And now he's hundreds of thousands of years old, as opposed to being the same age of all the other Primarchs. And that's going to be the Horus that goes to see the Emperor. Now, <clears throat> this is the same with the Emperor when the Golden Path, the Emperor originally wants to free humanity from the major problems that they had there, which I said were the Psych the, the the vampires, uh, mutants and these rogue psychers that could blow up at any time. That's no longer a problem. Now the problem becomes chaos. It's condensed down into just chaos. That doesn't come into like 2.0 and going into 3.0 of the emperor. And that's where we are right now. We're, 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 we're at that point. Now when we get into 5.0, of the emperor is bringing the emperor down to a human scale again, where he can get off the throne and walk around and fight in your campaign. And that starts to happen in the novel Master of Mankind. Uh, the emperor used to be on a, on a power level equal to the chaos gods, if you want to call them that. And um, so the idea that you would actually fight him is absurd. Any more than you would think of fighting, oh, you're going to go fight corn itself. Corn isn't a thing that you can go fight. Um, now they brought him back down to that level. Now in, in Master of Mankind, he got off the Golden Throne and went to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat with greater demons and could kill them easily, but they were actually able to wound him. He was actually able to bleed. This puts the emperor at one ten thousandth of the power that he used to be, where he could just make an entire legion kneel with a word, um, wipe out an entire legion with a, with a thought. Now he's fighting uh, greater demons in hand-to-hand, -hand, which leads me to believe that by the end of the Siege of Terra, even the Chaos Pantheons themselves could become playable figures. They're going to they're going to milk this shard mechanic. You know, the Catan used to be star gods. Then they became then they were put into their metal bodies, the necrodermis, and then the necrodermis has now been broken down into shards. So that's where that immense power has gone, and they're going to emulate this process with the Primarchs and with the Emperor. Magnus has soul shards some of which became chaos worshiping, some of which remained loyal to the emperor. The emperor has this now shattered psyche, and you're going to get emperor shards. Yes, a shard of the emperor that is going to manifest on the battlefield and, and fight with you if you have a, a Talons of the Emperor army. It's just going to be a shard. That's where we're going. I think that's the next step for the emperor. And if you're wondering why does the emperor, again, have gold, it's because of the golden path from Dune, now obsidian path. Uh, gold is actually historically not the color of, of emperors. Purple is, yes, purple is worth hundreds of times worth more than gold in ancient times. Um, that's why I think there's only two national flags that have the color purple and only as little specks. Yes, I believe that's true. You can look up why that is, why gold was for kings and purple is for emperors, because it's far more valuable than gold. <clears throat> so, so what else are we going to go? I think that covers all of it. So yeah, everything is coming down into a model range. Why does the, the emperor have a name? OK, I can tell you where that came from. That came from the Doctor Who. Okay, why do we not call a doctor by a name? The same reason. Why do we not call the master by a name from Doctor Who? Same reason. They took that from Doctor Who and put that into 40K because it's GW and GW is in the UK. 
This is the emperor. Does he have a name? Yeah. Well, the doctor has a name too. So does the master. Did you ever use it? Will you ever hear it? Will you ever see it? No, you won't. Will they ever write it down? Will the writers of the show ever change it to start calling the doctor by a name? No, they won't. Same with GW. That's the reason why. Boom. Um, I think that covers almost all of it. Uh, we, in the end result here is why, where the pseudo-religion came from, the draconian of the draconianism of the Imperium. I think that's all going to change. The Primarchs are going to come back. It's all going to become less draconian. And the whole 40 came is going to become less grimdark. Or if it is grimdark, it's going to be grimdark for fundamentally different reasons because the original reasons for it being grimdark just don't make sense and haven't made sense for 30 years. That's what we're going to see. Everybody's going to be able to be a figure on the battlefield from Chaos Gods to the Emperor to Primarchs. Everybody, because why not? It's just one more thing to sell. And that is what I see coming in the future. I hope that makes sense and you enjoyed it. 40K in 21 minutes. I'm impressed. Until next time. Bye. Yay.